you our 10 fundamental keys to effective presentation and persuasion. From the front of the room. Criteria for us to be effective in this context. First thing I want you to put at the top of your notes, most important thing for you to realize and remember, number one key of all is real simple. 80% of being effective in front of the front of the room is why to do it. 20% is how to. 80% of being effective from the front of the room and influencing other human beings, 80% of your effectiveness is going to come from you having a strong enough why. Why are you talking? What is the reason? You've got to have a sense of purpose in what you're doing. That is where your power is going to come from. How to say or how to persuade or how to put it across is only 20% of people believe. And if you can start with that belief system, you've got some real power. Because one of the things that I do whenever I go, I believe that of the 10 keys, the first key to effective presentation is belief, period. You can give me somebody who's much more articulate than myself, much more articulate than anybody else, and we'll blow them away. I can take somebody who's got more belief and blow them away from the front of the room. Because it is that power of belief that what you're saying has some kind of meaning that it has an impact on somebody's life that gives you that spark that gets through to other human beings. So I don't necessarily think about what I'm even going to say or how I'm going to say it a lot of times. What I know is I know what it is I have to get across, and I make it so important inside of me that there's, I just know it will come across. And I'm not worried about this word or that word. I don't have all that editing going on. And as a result, I can stay with my audience. If I'm inside my head and I'm going, oh my gosh, am I doing this right? Is this coming across well? Once you start doing that, you're in trouble. So the core belief you've got to realize is you can't fail from the front of the room. That's more than core belief. The other core belief is that if you've got a strong enough reason, all that matters is that you get the message across. If you do that, you're going to become articulate at times anyway, and people remember those things. When you weren't so articulate, they're not going to they're going to remember your passion, they're going to remember your power. So yeah, the biggest challenge, I think, in public speaking is somebody who's like trying to say the, just the right word at the right time. Because then what happens is they go, which one, internal or external? <laughs> internal. I have no internal dialogue when I'm speaking effectively. Zero. That is my power. I am totally in uptime. I'm outside here. Now, I can't pause for a moment if somebody's writing the notes down. That's when I might pop in my head for a second and think of something. You, I see you writing your notes. Boom, you're off for a second. I'm going to go grab inside of my head for a moment. <laughs> But 90% of the time, I'm out here with no internal dialogue at all. When I'm in trouble, quote unquote, like when I feel like I haven't done a great job, other people say, well, you did a great job inside me when I'm not satisfied. It's because I don't have that same spark or power, and it's because part of me was inside here. Something's going on, and I start talking to myself. As soon as I start talking to myself, it's over. What I do is I see, feel, and it goes. Right? It's an instantaneous thing that comes out of me, but it starts with that core belief. So you've got to learn to adopt that. So how do you adopt the belief? That's going to support you. Remember, we said the way to get a belief is you got this table, and the way to make sure the table feels solid is you've got to get some what? Legs. Some legs, which are called what? References. There's one R in references. References. Okay? And we want to get as many of those as possible, and that's what you're going to do through skill notes. We're going to get you up with small groups of people, right? About 40 people, and give you a chance to do something over and over and over and over again. And that's also how you get good at something. Right? You don't just do it one time. You know, Stuff that I'm doing in certification, sometimes the very first time I've done it, so it may not be as elegant as if I do a mind rev. Mind rev is wired. Right? I mean, I have to think wired because I've done it enough times that I know what I'm going to say. I don't think about what I'm going to say. I focus on how I'm going to say it. So it certainly may not be as wired as far as that's concerned. But what I make up for in not having clear what I'm going to say exactly or how I'm going to put it across or maybe the funniest way to do it, I make up for that with intention and intensity and knowing how important it is when I'm sharing with someone. So you've got to come from that place. If you didn't do anything else but really adopt that belief that you can persuade anyone because what you're sharing is important to you and you know it's important to them. If you can come from that place, there's very few limits that you can have. The other belief that you might want to adopt as still part of number one is that people want to listen to you. See, if, if you get up there and you're thinking, gosh, I don't know, I don't know what if they don't listen? What if, what if you know, they don't pay attention to me? If you have that thought in your mind, first of all, you're internal, you're not external. Second of all, you're going to project that. You're going to be tentative. You're not going to have the same power. When I walk in a room, I'm thinking, I am powerful. That's my belief before I walk in there. I am effective. I know these people want to hear what I have to say. And I've done that in places where they didn't want to hear what I have to say. But I said, I know inside. They may not know it yet, but they need to hear what I have to say, and they're going to want it once they know. Uh, when I worked with Ken Blanchard, one of the things that I did is I modeled some of his strategies. And Ken is one of the most likable people that you'll ever meet. He's like a big, giant, you know, teddy bear. Wonderful human being. And Ken's strategy is, he goes into some groups, right? He's going to talk to this corporate group. Before he walks up there, what he does inside of his head is he imagines what these people are going to look like when he's done. In other words, well, in other words, if you walk into a lot of groups, what happens for the traditional speaker is they don't have a lot of belief in who they are or what they're capable of anyway. They don't have any intention, they don't have any power. And they walk up there already intended, and they walk out and they look at this audience. And audiences are rarely, although your audiences will be a bit different program than wired for you. But the standard audience is not wired. I understand our audience is waiting there very cautiously. They might, you know, 
clap politely or something like that. But that's 99% of the audiences are like that. They're waiting to see what you have to say. They're not impressed. They're not into it. In their own life, they don't have a lot of intensity. So what the hell are they going to do to give it to you? They're trying to conserve what they got. <laughs> so you walk up an audience like that, and some of them may prejudge you by the way you look, by the way you dress, by what they've heard about you, or by the fact they don't want it to be in the room, depending upon where you're speaking. In those contexts, when you walk up, you say hello, and the room is dead, and there's no response. You have to learn how to take control. When I first started doing business seminars, you know, I used to only do my jokes, right, a couple years ago. I remember the first business seminar I did. I was used to, like, people come in, we have the music cranking, firewalk type of thing, right? I walk in there, and it is dead. I mean, absolutely. You can hear a pin drop. They're not even talking to each other. They're just sitting there waiting. Right? I finally come up there, and I go, good morning. <laughs>
If you're in a resource state, you have the ability to get strong or get relaxed or get balanced. If you can move to all those different states from a physiology like that, then you have a lot more power to be able to influence your audience. But you all know, and heard me share a lot of times, there is not a time when I go up to do a seminar where I don't put myself above level 10 to start with. That's my checklist under physiology. I make absolutely certain. Boom! Yes! Yes! Then I can relax, but relaxing is at this level. And if I'm gonna relax all the way down to like level eight, I mean I'm really like mellow jello. But meanwhile, what happens is people get a sense of power and energy from me. Because what I've done is I've opened up every channel. It's like I'm opening up my brain when I do that, not just my physiology in terms of gestures. If you get your entire body at that level of intensity, then what happens is what you're doing is open up circuits that probably aren't usually open. Now when something happens, it's like they're seeing the tip of the iceberg and they think it's a lot of energy. They go, boy, he seems like to be a powerful person. They don't have a clue. They have no clue. If, they don't, if I unloaded my full intensity, only a few people have ever seen me do that. I mean, people never forget it. But that intensity is something I learned to build. Like in martial arts, they talk about building key, key energy. That's what I learned to build intensely. I mean, that's what I can do something and wham, explode. So what I've learned to do, though, is how to use the appropriate amount. Jot down in your notes, don't shoot a cannon at a rabbit. <laughs> okay. okay, it works, but there's no rabbit when you're done. So what I have to learn to do is learn how to control, but most people don't have to worry about shooting a cannon or a rabbit. Most people have to learn how to become a cannon first. And you need to learn to become a cannon. Learn to develop that incredible level of power that, boom, you can send energy right into somebody's body just by the way you communicate. See, I'm a big believer. It sounds fluffy, like a total fluff fluff in here, but let me just tell you, when I walk into a room, I fill that room up with my energy. And what I mean by that is I can go into a room, depending on the dimensions and everything else, and I physically, how many of you have seen Carillion photography? So you know that around your body it's electrical energy, okay? And when you change emotional states, you can see the color and the shape of that shift instantly. This is not woo-woo stuff, it's measured. So I'm a big believer, I can feel it. It's a kinesthetic thing for me. That when I walk in a room and I can fill the room up with my energy, I make a point, I can send that point into somebody's body. That's my belief. Truly or not, that belief seems to empower me with a lot more congruency and power, and people seem to feel it. That all comes from physiology. So you've got to be able to have that, and also be able to be totally mellow in the appropriate context. Like, in this context, man, I've, like, dropped myself down as low as I can, because this room is like, you know, what am I going to do? Plus, I want you guys to be able to relax. I gave you a night off last night, because what I'm trying to do is pace your bodies a little bit, so that when we go to full gear, you're there and you've got some reserves. I don't want to blow out your reserves. But we're going to crank this mother. You know, and it's going to start out tonight cranking pretty good, okay? <laughs> so you just need to be ready. Yeah. Yeah. So we're going to pace it. I'm going to, I'm going to also pace things accordingly, and I'm going to really be sensitive to that process so that not everybody's been building up key for a while, and since last year I finally discovered that. <laughs> but at the same time, I'll still want to stretch people so they know what they're really capable of. And most of it starts here. And how much you have in physiology is really up here. It doesn't matter if you've got two hours sleep or ten hours sleep. And I do agree, if you're going to go for four weeks and have two hours sleep, it's not intelligent. And I've done that plenty of times. But what I'm saying is that we have to really make sure that we push people beyond and all we can do is for an example. So physiology from the front of the room that's flexible and it's powerful, that's resourceful, and also relaxed. So you've got to also have that kind of power to be able to be totally relaxing and boom, that intensity instantly if you need it. See, what that also does is keep people off balance which you need to be able to do if you're going to be a persuader, not just to present. So that at any time, I can go like this, and all of a sudden, bam, I can go to 0, 060 in two seconds. Right, or wham, somebody's like, so they're not ever quite sure what's going to happen. That's very valuable, it's going to line up with one of the things we're talking about. So what I want you to do also is have some visual gestures, some auditory gestures, some kinesthetic gestures. So what you might just actually give yourself a little exercise and actually moving your body a little bit differently. The other thing is, from a standpoint of physiology, is to control the room, one of the things that I do is I move. I use my whole body and I use the whole stage if you watch me. Okay, I don't stand, most speakers, if you watch them, they stand and they lecture and maybe they even have some gestures and stuff, but they're like planted. I'm not planted, I'm prowling up there. People get that sense. Okay, and when I make a movement, I make an entire movement many times. Now I've also got softer movements, but I learn to use my entire body. When you use your entire body, you're using your entire being, you're going to communicate with more power. So you find yourself like using one arm or the other arm or making gestures like this. I mean, try this. Take your hands. And just move your hands like this. <laughs> this is called the span standard speaker movement. <laughs> okay, now take your hands like that, same thing, and do what I do, which is take your hands like this, and when you snap them out, when you snap them out as far as you can, you extend your fingers. <laughs> okay, try it. Go. Okay, and you can add the sound. I'm impressed. <laughs> I can tell you how to say it, but you do it. It's like, boom, there it is. Yes, boom, there it is. The other thing I can tell you about 
physiology that I just discovered last year, or maybe it was year four, is I realized that a lot of my power comes from, a lot of what changes and what moves people, I realize, is tension and pressure. Think about it. What makes you want to go eat? Sense of what? Tension or pressure. But what is hunger? Tension or pressure in a particular part of your body. What makes you, when you want, what makes you enjoy and want to make love? It's a buildup of tension and pressure. Isn't it? Right. What's that? Well, throbbing is pressure. Right. Okay. So it's those feelings that drive us. When somebody finally, well, we've been talking about here when we talk about the triple P principle, pain pleasure principle, is we're getting people to associate enough pressure. That's what the pain is, right? Enough tension of pressure that's so uncomfortable that they decide they're going to change. Isn't that basically what we're talking about? So manipulating pressure, you know, you don't remember the metaphor, they talk about how a diamond is nothing but a rock that was produced, this incredible diamond, under massive pressure. That's what does it. And what I'm creating these 14 days for all of you is a pressure cooker. And you're allowing me to do it. You volunteered. Because I think all of you know that's how a diamond is shaped. How I've shaped myself is put myself under massive pressure. Other people say, you're crazy. I said, no, I like what it's made me into. Because for me, the game is not what you get, but who you become. And so I put myself on the line over and over and over again. You know the stories, but it's from putting myself in that place of pressure that I've been able to literally shape myself into who I want to be. As a speaker, I build up tremendous pressure, and I release it. That has power. See, I can do it at no time. I can be totally relaxed. But when I need it, I've built it up. You can't extend the need to act without extending some level of pressure or tension. So you've got to have some level of pressure or tension. Now you can do it very calmly by asking questions and asking questions to a point that causes that person to feel a sense of pressure to change because if they don't, they feel like they're missing out. Or if they don't, they're not living consistently with what they believe. So you can do it without any body at all, obviously. But you can also simultaneously be offering it by having pressure inside yourself that you release. And that sense of releasing pressure has tremendous power. So you might want to look at it. And again, you can do it subtly. You want to do it in my style. You can be doing it just a small amount of pressure and then release. But then think about it. What is excitement? When you have excitement, is there pressure in your body? Sure there is. If you just kept the pressure, what would it become? Yeah, it become pain. So what you got to do is release the pressure. Build and release. Build and release. Like having an orgasm. You'll enjoy it. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> just continue to use that process within yourself when you're communicating to other people to give you a whole lot more power. So you got belief, we got physiology. Third line, third line I jump down in the area is know your outcome. Know what your outcome is before you begin. I can't stress this enough. When I watch people from the front room who are ineffective, invariably they're not clear what their outcome is. One of the things that Brandon said the other day that she used on herself is she wasn't real clear what to do. She got up here and on her way up here she thought to herself, what's my outcome? Bam, she came across very powerfully. She got clear what her purpose was. If you don't have a sense of what your purpose is, you've got a problem. So you've got to know what's the final result, what I want to come out of this thing. You've got to remember your brain is a servo mechanism. Right? You think of like a missile? A missile knows how to get the target. Even the target moves. Because it knows what the outcome is and it keeps adjusting until it gets there. If you don't know what your outcome is, you've like turned off your servo mechanism. You want to turn it on and say, this is what I want to come out of the situation. Period. Now, if something happens and I'm not getting there, I'll just keep changing, changing, changing. But I know what it is I'm going for. I've got something that will pull me through all the muck of what's going on in the moment to where I want to go. If, like uh, yesterday or before a couple times, where I lost my train of thought, I lost what my outcome was. And so then I'm babbling for about five or ten seconds, right? And it irritates out of me. It's like, I need to do that. I need to move out of that. And that's because I was processing inside my head, coming up with some new stuff while I do it. That's why you got to stay outside as much as possible. Does that make sense? Or you've got to be in a context where you're creating, and that's okay with you, and you set up your audience appropriately as well. But that process of knowing what it is that you want is so critical. So you don't ever want to get in front of the room without getting precisely clear. Remember, clarity is power. The more clear you are on what it is you want to accomplish, the more power you've got. If you're not clear, you're not going to have your power. If you are clear, it's a piece of cake. You will come up with things and resources and metaphors and ideas that you never dreamed of. But here's the problem. Most people's outcome is when they get from the front the room is to look good or sound good. That's never my outcome. Or their outcome is to come across well. That's never my outcome. Or their outcome is to say what they're supposed to say. That's rarely my outcome, and when I do that, I create stress for myself. Right? It's like I'm trying to do it perfectly or say it the way it's supposed to be said. I, come back, I just lose that. But if your outcome is to produce a result in other human beings, and you know what that outcome is, and you know some of the content you want to share in the process, I'm telling you, you'll unleash your power. And if then you come back and you've got some physiology while you're doing it, which is congruent with the belief you've got that these people, I'm powerful, I'm effective, they want to hear me, what I'm sharing is important, you put all those things together, now you see somebody who starts out on the stage kind of like talking like this, and now has some real power in what they do. Okay? Again, I can't 
I can't uh, push it enough, the idea also, of moving your body, using more of your body, getting your whole body involved. Own the room. Own the space that you're in. Physically walk in, and when I do it, I throw out my energy. It's got to smack off that wall and come back to me. If I walk into a room and it holds a thousand people, all the more energy I have to be able to generate, otherwise I'll have no power. So put those pieces together. Fourth one I got down here is rapport. Listen, <laughs> I've seen some unbelievably powerful speakers who believe people should be listening to them. Right? They're absolutely are, you know, they got physiology like it's going out of style. They know what it is that they want to do, and they're trying to convert an audience. But they're not in a rapport, so it doesn't work. But they come as totally over gradient. So I only put this as number four because I see the first three are things you do before you step on the stage. Okay? The first three you gotta do before you even get on the stage. So when you're already there, those three are already in place. The fourth one is the first thing you've got to establish when you get on that stage. You have to make that connection with the audience. You have to get that audience to feel me too and not so what. That's critical. Absolutely critical. In fact, some of you I've shared this with, some I haven't, but I have a formula that I use as a persuader from the front of the room. So that's what I see myself as, not as a presenter. If I was a presenter, I'm trying to make all the words sound really good and put them in all the right orders and all that crap. That's not what I'm doing. I want to move people to action. As a persuader, I have this system that I use, kind of metaphor I utilize for myself, of what the persuasion process looks like. And that is, if you imagine a football field, and let's imagine it coming to a point, if we would, and our target's here, here's our outcome. And my outcome is always to get somebody to do something, to get them to take action, to get them to change a belief, to get them to make some kind of shift. I'm not just talking so they get some information, okay? Now, knowing that that's true, the first, let's say this is a football field, the first 40 yards in my football field, I have to get these people out here out of the stands and play with me. The only way I'm going to get out of the stands and play with me is I've got to develop something I call identification, ID. Identification is the rapport step, where I get people to say, me too, not so what. Most speakers go into the so what, and that's why they don't do it effectively. They're not, they don't have rapport from the beginning with the audience. You can be a much poorer speaker, but have a better rapport with your audience, and your audience is going to love what you do. So the first 40 yards, almost half the football field, is getting people to say, me too, and not so what. Getting them to feel connected with you personally. How do you do that? Well, it goes back for me. It starts with my belief system. My belief system is people like me and I like people. I care about people, so they're going to care about me. And I, it comes through in my voice. It comes through in the way I communicate. It starts with that. Second thing it starts with is before I walk up, I think about how they're going to look at the end of the train. Now, it's pretty easy at certification, <laughs> but I'm also walking up at certification. I don't have to worry about it. You know, the audience will be wired before we even open my mouth the first moment. But in a normal group, I've got to think about the report and think about what do I care about these people? Why do I care about these people? What's special about these people? <coughs> I ask questions. Make a note there. Ask yourself questions that will cause you to care about your audience. The easiest way to get rapport is care about who you're talking to. You gotta really care. Now that's not always easy when you're talking to strangers, right? But you gotta immediately turn them from strangers into friends before you open your mouth. And if you treat people, have you ever had somebody walk up to you you don't even know? And they walk up to you and they treat you like, you know, they really know you? How, how do you usually respond when they do that? Yeah, I mean, how many of you treat them back like they're a friend? In fact, you're not even sure, you almost like think, well, maybe I didn't know them, right? I did the same thing from the front of the room. That's what I want you to do from the front of the room. I assume like you've known them for years. If you walk up with this attitude and feeling like we've been connected forever from the very first thing, hey, we're part of the same team, and you don't say that, but you feel that in your gut, you can't believe it will happen. That's what I do in business seminars. That's why I converted to business seminars. I walked up there, and instead of getting up there, you know, cranking them and all that kind of stuff, I walk up there, I know what I've got to say is that important. I've got physiology, total power. I know who the hell I am, I know what I do. I know what my outcome is, and I know that my outcome is totally to empower them. And I think about how much I respect these people. And I start out by telling them that. I said, I feel privileged to be here, and I'll tell you why, because this audience, this audience is called salespeople, you are the 3% of the nation that moves 97% of the rest of the country, because nothing happens until something is persuaded or sold. And also, you have courage, like very few people have, because most of you I know are in commission. So you said, I want to be paid what I'm worth. I said, for some of you, that's become scary. Right? <laughs> for others of you, that's been rather rewarding. My goal today, and I'll tell them what it is, and I'm like with them, I said, hey, we're here together. You know, and I make that connection up immediately because I've got that feeling inside of me to start with. Okay? So I get that rapport and I get them. And I talk about the problems that I've got, the challenges. If you listen to me at a guest event or a seminar, anything I do, you get a lot of me too's. Talk about how I sabotage myself, I went to all the seminars, listen to all the tapes, and people go, yeah, me too, me too, me too. And they come up to me at the break and they say, you know, that sounds just like my story. <laughs> and I've done those things too. I've sabotaged, I've done them away, I've done all these things, right? Or I can just get up and I can delete all that stuff, right? It's right. I'll tell you how you can succeed too. 
Is that going to work? Of course not. So me too. 10 yards from the 40 to 50 yards is what I call logic and reason. Logic and reason. Logic and reason basically to me means the intellectual side, the content side. Here's what you should do. Here's why you should do it. Here's the details of it. You know, here's how it works, X, Y, Z. Here's how to do a six-step reframe. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. Here's what you say. Here's how you say it. That is the smallest part of what actually persuades someone. You need to give them just enough logic and reason to support them in taking action. They've got to be able to justify the emotional decisions you help them to make in a persuasion type of process. And in this room, you're going to be a persuader. The difference between me and other people who taught technology, like even when I just taught NLP, so people could literally say, I'm teaching the same thing Tony's teaching. Even at that time, we were different. And the biggest difference was I had more rapport. And when I went for this logic and reason, I made that simple and quick. I didn't spend 14 hours studying the logic and reason. I also got people to be persuaded to use what I was talking about rather than just to learn it. Okay, so I, I spent the smallest amount of time on this. Now, from the 50 yard line, the last 50 yards, half of that is spent on something we call attack and confess. Attack and confess. Attack and confess means this. You know that anything you're trying to persuade someone to do, there's going to be things that are going to stop them, otherwise they've already done it. So we want to get somebody to get on the pole. We know already there are going to be things that are up there. Or after somebody uh, has an accident on the skydive, you know darn well the people in there that now have got some major things. So I brought you in, and what we did is, first we ID. Right? Tell me what your experience was. What can we do? Some me too. There's people getting people to say me too. You remember that when we were in the, at the lunch area? Then we went through a little bit of logic and reason, and then attack and confess. And what I attacked and confessed is I confessed for somebody else. So you can attack yourself. That's the best way to do it, number one, to start with. And or attack yourself, confess you've been guilty of the thing that they're afraid to do, and you do it before they even tell you. Or confess for somebody else. Okay. So I said, if Keith was here, if you were there, right? I said, if Keith was here, I think maybe what he'd probably say is, remember that? Yeah. And you all nodded your heads and, yeah, yeah, right? We went through the attack and confess section. So we utilized all everybody else's own internal attacks. We set the whole thing up. So this is where we set up. If we want somebody to do something, this is the hell if you don't. Setting up the hell if you don't do something. But you do it elegantly. You don't do it by attacking them. You do it by attacking yourself, or by confessing you've been guilty, or by confessing for somebody else. Okay. So you, I get up and I say, listen, you know, I don't always use this stuff. I screwed up. I've used this, this language pattern over here, and I've beat myself up so bad, and I've been guilty. But you know what? I'm not going to do it anymore. Because you know what the cost was for me? It cost me this and this and this. And I don't want you to have to experience that. They boom. It's hammered. Last section, or well, let's say all the way down to the 99 yard line, we got one yard left. But the rest of this section here is called solution. Solution is you say, God, I did this and this, I put it off, I didn't take action, I didn't follow through, but you know what? Finally, I decided the solution. And guess what happened? This is the heaven if you do. Recognize pain pleasure in here anywhere? <laughs> Finally, I did. I put myself in the line. I put myself out there. And i got to tell you what the rewards were. My life changed in so many ways. All of a sudden, I had this connection. All of a sudden, I felt this love. All of a sudden, I felt a sense of power. All of a sudden, I could shape my own destiny. All because I did this. And that's what I want you to have the privilege and opportunity to have. I've got that privilege. You deserve it, too. Boom. You got it immediately. You're licking what? Pleasure to the process. The last one yard line, this last yard, is asking for the action. Ask for the action. And if you've done your job up front, where you got rapport, you taught them the logic and reason, you attacked and confessed, you came up with a solution, then asking for them to take action should be a piece of cake because they've now linked lots of what if they don't do it? You know, lots of what if they do? If you've done it effectively and you had rapport, so they trust you and believe in you, you should be able to influence them very easily to take action or do whatever it is you need them to do. This is the process. It is over and over. So I use my TV show. My TV show, I set the thing up, up front here. ID, little logic and reason. There's very little in there about neurosocial conditioning. In fact, we don't even call it that. Why? Because that's 10, 10 yards of the thing that will happen, and some of you might get all caught up in that and not hear my right message. Then what's the whole thing? Attack and confess. I tell my story. Here's what I used to do. Here's where I am. I get other people to tell their story, talk about how this was, and here I am now, and I get them to talk about the solution. I talk about, hey, here's how my life is. They talk about how their life is, and at the end, we ask for the money. Right? They say, right now it's time for you to take off and make the thing go. And the last thing I say is, you know, design your life now. If I'm going to get my helicopter, and we're out of there. I have a little note there that says, come fly with me. <laughs> That's in essence what's under there, right? This is the process. 
most effective no, uh, direct response television show in the United States. Nothing even close. We're outproducing anybody else by three times. Right. Yeah. 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 yeah! This is the process. Rapport is critical. Make sure you think in terms of rapport. You think about your audience, how you care about them. Also, my notes here I put down, make sure you learn to speak visually. That's nice to make congruent, isn't it? <laughs> Auditorily. What kid is that? Right. You want to be able to move with all your notes. So that when you're talking, you get intense, and you can also drop right down. You can enter the world. And pop back up. The ability to go into all these different modes at any moment in time, depending upon what you want to accomplish, is critical. So being able to have that kind of flexibility with yourself, that in a heartbeat, you can instantly shift gears. Now it's true, when you're talking about things for the first time, right, you're start, first starting to learn how to articulate something, it's a little more difficult to also simultaneously learn to vary in everything else. That's why you're going to go to, like, my one day, after a year and a half now, it's wired. I change a little piece here and there, but I know exactly. I've tried things, and I know it's what works and what doesn't work. My body stores anything that works. The way I told a joke, I tell the same joke, I tell the same story, and I notice a slight change in the inflection of my voice takes a totally different emotional response. My brain locks in under that. But it takes all those trial and error presentations to learn those hooks. And once I hear a hook, I hang on to it, I grab onto it. Right? I do another one, and I get another hook. And after enough time, I got so many hooks, I got a presentation, it's phenomenal. When I'm doing something brand new, I may not have the same level of quality, but I'm not worried about that because I'm still coming from my core belief. Okay? All I want to know is can I influence? My job is to be someone of influence. I can get you a million people who can inspire people, make them feel real good, and never do anything. That's not my goal. That's not my goal for you as a trainer. My goal for you as a trainer is to cause you to be a monster who can go and use your thoughts and your mouth, your being, to walk in anybody and move them to action. That is how we shape a world. That's how you change values, beliefs. That's how you change lives. So don't be a presenter, be a persuader. Remember this core issue, after knowing your outcome, you've got to have a rapport. Next one I jotted down here for you is manipulation of the audience. Manipulation of the audience. And in your notes right now, that's what they're paying you for. That's what they're paying you for. They're paying to be manipulated. You paid to be manipulated. Why did you come here? Because you know damn well it's going to manipulate the hell out of you. Am I right? Yes or no? Yes. 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 So what's that called? Manipulation. Get you to say yes, right? Get you to respond. Get you to climb a pole. Get you to jump out of a plane, right? You can do all those things without me. You can go find a way to go parachuting all that stuff. It's something you do. But you came here because you wanted somebody to manipulate you. Audiences want to be manipulated. We want to be entertained. That's manipulation. We want somebody to mess with our brain. We want somebody to change our what? State. We want somebody to change our state. So I come into a business group, and whammo, I get in there and I set them up, I pre-frame them. I talk to them about what we're going to do today and how important it is. And I get them to link lots of pain and not going for 100%, lots of pleasure going for 100%. And then I said, listen, I'd like to share with you something that I've learned to do with top CEOs around the country. Only top Fortune 500, excuse me, 50, Fortune 50 CEOs do this. And only with other CEOs. So I should warn you in advance, it's like really conservative. So if you're like way out there, you probably won't like this. But if you're like a really conservative person, you'll enjoy this process, and it'll make you much more effective in getting most out of me. Would you please stand up? Bam! Instantly, I got them responding to me. I got them. I'm telling them to stand up. They're responding. I start out in the very beginning, and I take control of my audience. One of the first things I do. If I can take control of the audience in the beginning, I'll have control in the end. If you don't take control in the beginning, you won't have control in the end. Now, notice I put rapport before I said manipulate your audience. If you try and manipulate before rapport, you've lost them for probably good. So you've got to make sure you got rapport first. But as soon as I got rapport, I got them standing up. And at that point, they're standing up. They're waiting. I said, OK, here it is. It's real conservative. So again, hang in there. Please turn to the person next to you and just reach out and give them a massage. Right? And they start to laugh. It's a pattern room. They wouldn't do it when they did a massage before. But when I pre-framed them like that, and there's plenty of rapport, and I ID'd with them, and they're doing me too, me too, I got them laughing. I got them doing a massage training. I got these business guys who never touch another human being, and they're doing this stuff like this. right? Nobody can believe it. Within three minutes of not being there, I got these business people in a room, a thousand of them in a room. How many have been to the business owner? Okay, a thousand in a room, and we're out there climbing one. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, screaming. Walls are shaking, man. People are going nuts. They can't even believe you get a group of business people to do it. And I couldn't before because I didn't get rapport first strongly enough before I tried to do that. I assumed the rapport the way I did in my mind rep seminars, and it's a different audience. So it's critical, but you've got to manipulate your audience. How can you manipulate them? Tell stories. When you tell somebody a story, they go into a trance. Why do you go to movies? Because you get to trance out. You get in the experience. When somebody's in the experience, you've totally manipulated the audience. You've got them in control. Ask questions. You watch this weekend, you'll see, how many questions do you think I ask in a period of time? <laughs> I'm asking them constantly, aren't I? 
over and over again. And whenever I ask a question and I tie it down very often, what I'm doing is I'm getting the person to respond mentally in their head so they stay with me. How many of you do this already yourself? Let me see your hands. Okay, what's that called, right? And if they don't do that, here's what a lot of speakers do. They go, 20 minutes, let's see a show. And when they don't get the response, what do most speakers do at this point? If they even dare even ask that kind of question in the first place, which most of them won't do because they're afraid people won't respond. But if they did it, come on, what have you seen speakers do? Yeah, that's right, they back off. They start trying a few times, and they see that the audience is responding, they kind of let go and say, oh, I'll just go over here. You know? Not me, I say, come on, raise your hand. I'll mess with the audience. You go, how can you do that? Belief. Belief in physiology. Listen, when any two human beings meet, the one that's most congruent will control the situation, period. And I know there's nobody in the audience who's more congruent than I am. Because right? I'm prepared. They didn't come in here for that reason. I came in for that reason. And if they think they're as congruent, great. Then I can really get them amped out. Because I can challenge them. See, and then I've got to control them again. Then I manipulate them again. I'll play on whatever pattern they got. But I know in any situation, you might want to write that down, in any situation where two human beings meet, the person who's most congruent will control the situation, period. Period. So you've got to make sure you have more congruency. Now, also, congruency means you've still got to be flexible, right? You can't just go up there and just demand from your audience they're going to do something. Well, you can get up and demand and then break their pattern. Start to demand, then go, please. Right? Or go, please raise your hand. You can do any, anything that, whether it works or not, doesn't matter. You try something, you notice if it works. It doesn't work, what do you do? Yeah. Find something else, right? But you've got to get in that place. So use pattern interrupts. That's one of the ways you interrupt your audience. You set them up for something, you change them. And that's all humor is. Humor is nothing but a set of pattern interrupts. You set somebody up, they're going up this one light, wham, you get them on the other side. So I've got here, use embedded commands, use metaphors, create associated and disassociated states in your audience, depending upon what you're talking about. So if I talk about the morgue, I do that for a reason, right? I'm using an anchor, and I can create a state change. If I want to talk about skydiving, I'm going to use a different one. There's certain times I want to disassociate you, some certain times I want to associate you. But pattern ups are probably the most important thing you do to manipulate your audience. Next, behavioral flexibility is number six. God, I can't, you know, I can't, this is not even something I should even have to talk to you about. If you can't flex your behavior, you can't control an audience. Period. You have to be so flexible that no matter what happens in your audience, no matter what occurs, wow, you can handle it immediately. Again, that starts with belief. Number two, it comes from not being afraid to try almost anything. Number three, it comes to the belief that if something doesn't work, you'll just do what? Else. And your notes again, write down. If what you're doing isn't working, try anything else. Try anything else. You've got to be flexible. If what you're doing isn't working, try anything else. So I'll give you an example. I was doing a, a seminar in Detroit, Michigan, a one-day business seminar about a year ago. And logistics were horrible. We were just getting them started. The, somebody didn't have enough manuals there. People were sitting out in a hallway that was not air conditioning. I mean, it was hot. People were sweating in their suits. They were angry walking in. And then this, I was there, but the back of the sound wasn't set up properly, so they started like 30 minutes late. 30 minutes late, sweating in the hall, and they didn't even get one of these little, you know, uh, what do you call it, notebooks. People were very, very upset. I get up there, right, start doing my thing. We get to about the fourth page of the book, and all of a sudden this guy stands up and he goes, I stand up there for 30 minutes. We started 30 minutes late. I'm sweating. Screaming, going crazy, just stood up right there and confronted me. And what do you do? What do you do? That's my question. Can you ask him a question? What else can you do? That's right. Deborah said the right thing. Tommy's right. I said, You are absolutely right. That is totally unfair. And you can't imagine. You think it upsets you? How do you think it makes me feel when I'm up here trying to give my guts to support you and I'm not being backed up? It totally pisses me off. <laughs> I say, you know what, you have every right to be upset, and you have every right to be able to leave here if you want to. Because I don't want you to stay here upset. And I'm happy to refund your money, and you should leave. <laughs> I said, you know what, because I also, I'm trying to support a lot of these other people, I don't want them to be interrupted. You have a right to be upset, but I can't let you interrupt them. So I suggest that you leave, and we'll give you your money back, and I apologize. <laughs> He said, well, I, I might stay. I said, no, no, you won't might stay. You're either going to stay and play full on and be happy, even though you're sweaty. <laughs> or you can leave now because I don't want to be unfair to you. How's that for a nice because, Frank? All right, All right. Hey. Answer, right? Because I don't want to be unfair to you. <laughs> I said, are you here to play? And that, the whole audience, by the way, started laughing hysterically. 
Because my response is they're expecting me to like back down or go, oh gosh, or me to say, I'm really sorry, sir, or say, you know, you, can't, you, know, you don't have to be that upset about it, or, or like play games with him. I totally broke his pattern. I responded in a way nobody expected, and they're laughing hysterically. And now I have the audience on my side, right? And they're all giggling at each other. I'm going, so I'm that down, so I'll take a break anyway. Okay. So what you've got to be able to do is come back in a way that people don't expect. Behavioral flexibility really means having nonlinear responses. And nonlinear responses, linear response is X, A happens, then B, and that means C is going to happen. Something's going to be around me, A is going to happen, then maybe Z is going to happen. Right? I, they don't know what to do. Keeping people off balance is critical to a certain extent. Now, you want to have a certain amount of flow, otherwise you have something that just jars people so much that they can't take it or they live in a trance. And there are places in your presentation where that can be useful. But what I'm saying to you is you've got to be able to be totally flex with what's going on. So if I come in, I got real intense with him, by the way, and he got even more intense, what do you do then? Get even more intense. You get even more intense, okay. You haven't seen anything reach threshold, you get killed. <laughs> but I, I might change the approach. Do you remember how many last year remember there was a lady with short hair? She was in the front row. She was one of the people that the first day she came up to me screaming in my face about not having a room. I mean, she was so vicious. And I just turned to her and I said, listen, I want to support you. If you don't want to be supported, um, then I'm happy to have you go. I don't want you to go. I'm happy to have you go. She just said, don't use that NLP shit on me. I started breaking her pattern. Right? I said, I wouldn't dare use that shit on you. You're using it on yourself. <laughs> so I messed with her. So I break her say a little bit and stuff. But then if you remember in the big room, um, like four or five days into it, she stood up and said, like, I'm not getting her. This isn't working for me or something like that. And I went over there and I got in her face. Yeah. Right? And she she got back, and I got back, and I was like, boom, boom, boom. And there was a point where I amped her, and amped her, and amped her. Right at the moment where I amped her, I stopped, and I reached out, and I gave her a kiss. You know that? Yeah. <laughs> she didn't know how to deal with it at all. I had no way to deal with it. Because I set her up one way, and then when I saw that that wasn't working, I decided, I made the decision, okay, I'm going to switch. But before I switched, though, I want to have more of a pattern. So I pushed her even further. Right when I got her right at threshold, wham, snapped her in another direction. No way to deal with it. So think about it. Same thing you remember with uh, Claire. Yeah. yeah, how could you forget? <laughs> with Claire, we're going back and forth, and I got intense with Claire, and he got intense, and back and forth, and I played with the intensity, and I started messing with the thing. And finally, what I had to do is I started pouring him down, and got all the way down around there, and where did I stand? Stood next to him, and then I stood on the side of him, right? And then talked about that piece until I got him totally enrolled in what I was doing, got real soft, green, and foamed around. Okay? But you gotta know, some people can do that, but that's not gonna change. Some people gotta get like this. You gotta have enough variety. You gotta constantly be flexing. If something doesn't work, change. I don't care what it is, change. Now, some of you know the story I've told, that it's one of the more intense experiences I had when we were involved in Certainty in America. It was a multi-level marketing organization. And we got involved because we believed 100% of the principles. And the founder of the company was a phenomenal man. And his name was David Allen. And I really bonded with this guy, I really wanted to support it. And I went around the country and did speeches to support what they were doing. And the organization, David Allen was a black man. And the organization was about 60% black. But when I say black, I mean militant black. Not like, I'm not black, white doesn't matter to me. But to them, black meant something different. <clears throat> and a group of them invited me to come speak. But see, they were told by David Allen I was the most powerful speaker they'd ever seen in his life. And so they assumed I was black. <laughs> <laughs> so I walk in, we're talking militant. We're talking about a value system. We're not talking color now. We're talking about a value system of people who make black something that is totally different, and if you're white, that means pain, right? And if you're black, it means pleasure. So I walk in there, right, to speak. There's not one white person in the group except me, and I walk up and introduce me, and the audience just freaks. <laughs> I mean, they can't even believe it. I start to speak, and I'm not quite sure why I'm getting this response, and I'm finally getting a clue in my head. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and then as I'm talking and doing this stuff, right, finally, somebody stands up and says, how can you always use white examples? I said, what? <laughs> right? And as it came to be, they try to like they try to position me as only you know making this. I, I, I talked about a white knight in one of my metaphors. Real brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> Real rapport builder. Right? <laughs> anyway, long story short, I finally, as the group got bigger, when we went in the afternoon session. We had a bunch of other people in as well, and I just totally broke the pattern. And I've used it now about two or three times since then in similar situations. But now what happens? I have a mixture of white and black, but primarily black. And I'm talking along, and somebody gets up again and says, how come you keep using white people on stage? And I just go, well, I could have thought, you know, I haven't been watching colors. I have been like, you know, one for you, one for you. I haven't been doing that. And I said, but this woman who stood up, she goes, you know, what am I, a honky? 
I had her on stage doing love strategy track. And so um, the audience is like, mm, and it was like one of those little tension things. I said, you know what, guys? This one person was like totally in my face. I turned and I said, sir, I said, you know what? You won't believe this, but I actually care about you. You know, I know you don't believe that because I'm white. And of course, white people couldn't possibly care about someone whose skin is darker than his. And I know you couldn't possibly care about me, but maybe you even do and don't know. Who knows? So what am I starting to do? Put him in a real life or what? France. And I say to them, I say, you know what? As long as, I'd like to help you, and you may not want to help, but I want to offer you something. As long as somebody can turn to you, and by their skin or by what they say, take control of you, then what happens is you never will be free. Your issue is freedom, clearly. As long as a man can look at you and say, nigger, the whole room went, <laughs> it's as long as somebody can do that, as long as somebody's called you nigger and get that kind of response I see in you right now, when you're ready to explode, then what you've done is given that person absolute control of you. You have no control in your life. You are still a slave. <laughs> I said, you are. But well, you're being enslaved by you and nothing else. And I said, I'd like to have you be free because I'm free and I'm white. So why don't you pretend that we're going to get you free right now? And I suggest here's the way to do it. Everyone stand up. I said, stand up. Come on, try something with me. Trust me just for a moment. Pretend I'm black. <laughs> I get him to stand up, right? Now I'll stand up. I said, now you guys just do what I do just for a minute if you really want to be free and if you want to have some fun. So let's try this. I stood up and I said, okay, follow me. Do what I say, say what I say, move the way I move. I'm a nigger. You might want be a nigger to be a nigger. Ooh, be a nigger. <laughs> I'm an angry, and pretty soon these other guys are like this, start laughing. As soon as they do, like, oh come on, try it, you know, come on. By about the third attempt, I got them all going, oh, I'm an angry, and what I got to do? Laughing, giggling, saying I'm an angry. What I'm doing? Changing the what? Anger, changing the nerve association. Then I say, okay, and they're all giggling, right? They're looking at each other, going, oh, I'm an angry, you're an angry. Then I turn and I say, okay, we're not done. Repeat after me. I'm a honky, you are a honky. When you're and I said, I'm a honky nigger, you're a nigger honky. We do this whole thing. They're painting each other going, there's one guy who's like most militants walking over this other white guy in the audience and going, hey, honky nigger, how you doing? He goes, hey, nigger honky, how are you? <laughs> and I give each other hugs and the whole bit. And you go, my God. And people turn to this one guy in the back who was looking to do business with me at the time. He said, man, you go like a steal. <laughs>
So as I'm talking, wham, all of a sudden I make eye contact, and I stay with that person just for a minute. Get strong with that person just for a minute. Right? Make the connection with them. So if I'm asking something, let's say I'm making a predictive challenge, I'm saying something like, hey, are you going to be free now? I'll look at one person right there that I think wants to be free, or I want them to be free, and I'll direct right at them for that moment. Or I'll lock on. So that's another way to challenge, is actually take it one individual at a time, it'll give you more power. Okay? Next, energy. Energy is critical. You gotta have dynamic, powerful energy. You gotta be charismatic. And all charisma is, is power and energy. Your ability to move in a way with absolute, total congruency and intensity. It's not just that, you know, having this floppy little energy popping out of you, but punctuating what you do with some intensity. That will give you that. If you can constantly have that level of energy, what happens is you scoop up an audience with you. But you gotta have that. And again, the only way to have the energy is to make sure you start out with it. Before I walked up here, I didn't have this level of energy, but when I just got up here, before I walked on up here, I stopped putting myself in state. As I'm walking in, I start moving my body in a way where I'm ready. So by the time I get up here, I can kick right into high gear. But you gotta realize, 80% of charisma is energy. If you've ever seen somebody, think of somebody you think is charismatic. I preach the comment, but beside, outside of me, who can you think of? Now think about it. Do they have low or high levels of energy? What would you say? How many experience high? Definitely high. I can't think of anybody that has a tremendous amount of charisma let them feel a sense of energy. Even if they're kinesthetic on their delivery, there's a sense of energy that's coming out of them the whole time. It comes through in their face and the way they express themselves in their eyes. It's punctuated. I'm trying to think of a gentleman. Who's that gentleman who's super articulate? Um, William Buckley. You ever watch William Buckley? He isn't talking loud and fast, but he still has that energy, doesn't he? And what it is is the energy, he's, he's got a certain amount of tension in his body, and he releases it, and he releases it subtly with a smile, with his eyes, or whatever the case may be, with the tone of his voice. He punctuates it, but there's an energy there for him to do it. He isn't just at a normal level like this, and talking like this, and moving and communicating like this. You gotta start at a certain place, and then again express it. Go back to the pressure point we talked about. Um, the last two points that I give you the most important, the next one is utilization. Utilization is critical. Most of you have gotten very good at this. Our trainer staff are fabulous at this. And you can learn a lot from them by modeling them. Utilization means something happens. You find to take whatever's happening in your eyes and figure out how to utilize it to help you to get the results you always wanted in the first place. Utilization is what you had to do when you got out there to the parachute drop the first day. You have to figure out how to utilize it, otherwise why you just feel frustrated and upset. Lousy speakers have things happen in their room, and when it happens, they go, that's it. My whole, screw my whole talk got screwed up because of that. What you want to learn to do is something happens, if there's any way possible on Earth, which there is always a way in my belief system, how can we utilize that? I was doing a guest event in San Diego about, um, I guess, three weeks ago. It was my final guest event, my final mind related down there. And I get up and doing this guest event, and this lady comes on stage whose husband is becoming an ADL. And she's a really neat, nice lady, but she's like been in a deep trance for about three days, right? And so while I'm talking everything else, I'm asking people why they're here and so forth, and you know, reporting with the audience up front, getting people to share so I can tailor what I'm going to talk about to meet their needs. She raises her hand and talks about she has this fear of public speaking, and her husband's going to become you know, a speaker now. She didn't say ADL, right? Thank God, because the way she was communicating was real powerful. And she said, you know, I really want to deal with that. And I said, well, I appreciate that. We can show you the skills to do that. In fact, your husband can probably help you with it. And I'm not going to use that example right now. This is not dramatic enough. I said, let me find a more dramatic one. I was looking for like something where somebody had a major, major phobia so I could wipe it out for the estimate as a demonstration. Well, as I'm talking, for well, the next couple minutes, this woman walks up around the room, walks up on the stage while I'm talking. <laughs> you know, and, 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 and it's a seminar, it's a guest event, so what we're doing is the purpose of the seminar is to give people information and to enroll them on the power of our technology. And this lady gets up here, right? And I, I go, hello. <laughs> She goes, I just wanted to like, you know, deal with this thing right now. A little self-sorting there, I guess. Right? And I said, uh, she goes, is that okay? And I said, no. She goes, well, I need to. And she walks up to the front here. So at this point, my brain goes, okay, this is fun. <laughs> what an opportunity, right? Now, if I get her off the stage, I can lose rapport with my audience. There's going to be people in that audience sitting back going, God, he was mean to that person. Uh, if he really cares about people, he should allow them to do those kinds of things. Are there people in the audience who think that way? Yeah. Yeah. And when I do that, I can lose rapport. Or it creates a little doubt. They go, God, why was he strong with her? Or even if I do it softly, soft wasn't doing it. I said, no, I smiled, tried to be soft. She didn't get soft. The only way you're out is a little bit harder, right? 
or I'm going to put her in a deep trance, which they're not going to know what the hell I'm doing. They're going to go, what is this hocus pocus? So I finally decided, great, she's here, let's run with it. So I got off the stage. I figured if I get off the stage and leave her there, she'll probably freak and leave. No, that didn't work either. <laughs> she gets up and she, like, the whole audience is waiting, right? And I had this momentum going. I had the audience laugh and I was on a roll. Right at the point, I'm on a roll, right in the middle of a joke, they're cracking up. She walks up and does this thing, right? She goes back and she gets, you know, the microphone and, you know, comes up here like this. <laughs> The whole audience is going like, come on. Oh, I said, so what is it you want? What's your outcome? She goes, just this. I said, uh, what's this? She goes, well, just connect with the audience. I said, this is called boring audience. <laughs> and the audience laughed, right? And everything else I said, if you're, what's your outcome? What is it you're trying to accomplish? She goes, I just want to feel connected. I just want to feel connected. So she just stood up here. She goes, um, you know, it's, I've in my life always had fears, and it's been really tough, and so this is like really a stretch for me and stuff, and I'm now becoming an ADL. Freaking <laughs> 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 out, right? I'm becoming an ADL. I pulled her husband and went, like, <laughs> no, I'm going to kill him. I just in on him. You know, so that I can go and share this stuff with people all over the country. <laughs> and she goes, and I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward and, you know, I'm going to go through these trainings and I'm just going to be the best there is and all those kinds of things and stuff. And I said, great. And I said, now you've accomplished what you came up here for and I'm wondering if you can accomplish something more. As you walk down those stairs <laughs> and you find yourself in your seat, sitting comfortably, I want you to then think about the fact that you accomplished what you wanted, but was it appropriate for an entire audience? Was it appropriate for their time that you gave them? Did you really have their permission? Yes, many of them wanted to support you here, and I'm really impressed by this audience, because they're willing to just be there with you, so you could deal with something that was important to you. But did you really give back? And so my question for you as you sit in that chair is, what do you need to give back, or how can you give back since you took some of you? I know some people are willing to have you take. They're willing to give to you. Others may not be. I want you to think about how you're going to give back as you find yourself back in your chair. Yeah. So she has thanks and wonders. I'm off in a trance, right? And the audience kind of claps, kind of funny. And so I get up, and the energy is just like going from up here to right? it's on the ground. And I go up and I said, So let me ask you a question. What makes somebody do something like that? Well, that's what I did. I totally changed the frame. Because I knew it was a question they were asking. What the hell made her do it? <laughs> so I just come up there. I said, Let me ask you a question. If I told them they get to filter it, they get to do all this stuff by asking a question, I control their focus in that moment. Okay, I utilize it. Second, I said, what would make a human being do something like that? Why does a woman wind up here in a trance and talk to you? She's obviously probably an intelligent woman, but she didn't come across as powerfully as she could. Would that be fair to say? And I'm like, yeah. I said, what would make her do that? I said, the exact thing I was talking about before she walked up here. I said, think about it. She linked to being on the stage a way to get rid of what? Pain. Or a way to develop more what? Pleasure. I said, that's exactly what you did. And it was kind of weird, wasn't it? Right? And more than one, yeah. But I said, you think that's weird? And then I deframed it. I utilized it. I said, you think that's weird? I'll tell you what's weirder. Somebody gets a little tension in their life, and then they go, eat. That's weirder than walking up on a stage. Or somebody goes out in their life, and they don't feel great, and they jam some drugs in their body. That's a hell of a lot weirder. Or somebody gets all upset, and they blame it on their spouse. The next thing they're on their divorce. That's weirder. How many of us have ever been that weird anywhere in our life? Boom. Oh. I said, so humans are weird. <laughs> we all are weird at times, right? But we got to learn how to make less of our life weird, except when we want it that way. we got to learn how to make these changes. And, that's, and then what happened? People came out and said, God, that was the most powerful demonstration I've ever seen. <laughs> it was so amazing, because I realized that what she did is like what I do in my life over here. It's like, you know, before that you were saying it, I mean, after I saw that, it was just like so incredible. The utilization. Would I put it up in there again to make the point? Of course not. <laughs> But I, it came out of a situation where, wow, well, I went right back to here with the audience, and I utilized it. I'm not saying encourage the interruption. I'm saying when it happens, make it part of your presentation. Find a way to make it part of it. I could have gone up there and, like, been freaked out in my mind going, oh, my God, she said she was an ADL. This is my organization. She's representing me. Holy shit. I don't want to be here with these things. Could have gone up and done these things and said, well, that was an interesting interruption. Uh, let's go on. <coughs> that worked as well. Uh, no way. I turned it into an example of what I was doing. And that's what you got to do each time. Something comes up, utilize it. Somebody says something, utilize it. That's just like 
you know, that reminds me of. Or, you know what, that is exactly what I'm talking about. You know, somebody says, I can't do this. That's why we're doing this. Turn it, whatever it is, turn it back on it. Something drops, hey, let that idea drop in place. Find ways to utilize whatever is going on in your audience. It'll give you tremendous power. Last key number 10, and I'm out of here, is have fun. 10 keys, you gotta have fun, otherwise you're not gonna be powerful in front of the room, not long term. If you're having fun, oh yes, okay, great, we'll show that. Having fun to me is critical. I mean, you can tell the difference between somebody's getting up there and they just got a message they gotta deliver, and somebody's got a message they gotta deliver, but they enjoy it. They enjoy the sharing. And if you can really make sure you don't ever get caught up in the point where you're stuck, where it's like, this is what I have to do, but you really remind yourself this is what you choose to do, and you think about how lucky you are to do what you do, and you come from that place, and you are playful within yourself, you put yourself in a state of playfulness, that will come through with your audience. The people want to be played with. Right? They really do. They don't want to have somebody who just jams something down their throat. You can jam, but you can also be playful. You've got that unique balance of get people to listen and get them to have fun, and people want to be entertained more than they want to be educated. Jot it in your notes. Those people would much rather be entertained than educated. That's why most people make changes. So what I try to do, and most of the seminars I've created, is to entertain people while I educate them. If you doubt this is true, that people are being entertained and educated, just go to watch a Grateful Dead concert, <laughs> or Bruce Springsteen, or anything else like that. I mean, clearly, think of the thousands of people who show up for that. We got invited people to come to a seminar, they don't show up in groves quite like that. I don't care what the seminar is, they're not going to do it. Right? We, the highest paid people in our country, are not educators, they're what? Yeah. Entertainers. I mean, so that'll give you an idea of where we put our value systems. Okay, so what you want to be is you want to be an entertaining educator. Somebody who persuades people but entertains them along the way. Are these 10 useful for you? Yes or no? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. Right. So what I want you to use is use these as criteria. I've given Bob a series of exercises to put you guys through to help you start embedding some of this stuff, really utilizing your physiologist, you're up and speaking. But I also want you, in your teams, you're going to have three people in your teams, and you're working with your teams, you're doing skill mills, to maybe have these ten really in your body, maybe write them on a card or something, and analyze. Okay, which did I do? Well? How, was I, how was the belief level? What was the physiology like? Hey, did the person really know their outcome? How much rapport did they have? Right? Did they manipulate their audience or not? Make sure you start looking at it, maybe giving yourself a scale of 0 to 10 where you are in those areas, and think about, okay, how can it get better? Right. Last thing I want to tell you is this. On the back of your notes or somewhere, just jot this down. Three major keys that we're going to chunk up to effective speaking are these. Number one, have something good to say. Steve Perman is great at telling jokes because he's got to be storing them all the time. He's already got something good to say. I'm not quite as good as that. I haven't stored them up. i got to do that. i got to model it. But you got to have something. You've already, a repertoire you've already built up. And my repertoire right now is so humongous I can get up for 30 days and not stop and have plenty of material. Right? I mean, really can. I've built it and built it and built it. I have so much that I know can be good to say. So I know it's there. That's number one. Number two, say it well. Practice saying it well. And you're not going to say it well the first time. So I'm going to move my certification. There are going to be times where I'm going to fumble and say, I mean, I'm okay with that. But I want to do it enough times, like in a mind river or one day or whatever, that I know I'm going to learn to say it incredibly well. You know, think of phrases you can use that will induce states. Think of ways of saying those phrases. Make your life a masterpiece. You know, think about how you can say things that induce a state when people hear it. Put some things together. You can use quotes as an example of it, too. Think of some quotes. I remember uh, Churchill saying, what is it? Uh, Truth is incontrovertible. Malice may attack it, ignorance may deride it, but in the end, there it is. Some things just hard to say better than that. <laughs> All right? Learn to say it well. And number three, Say it with emotion. Say it with emotion. Emotion is your power. You must have it within yourself to give it to somebody else. So think about the process of, one of the metaphors I like to use is, you know, you buy a shirt, like a man's shirt, you have those little stick pins in it, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. You take those little stick pins, right? If I took that stick pin, let's say oh, that stick pin is a word. I take that stick pin, and I want to influence you, and I take that word, and I throw it at you like this, and I smack you with that little pin. Are you going to feel very much of it? Of course not. But what if I take that little stick pin, and on the back of that stick pin, I wire a giant iron bar <laughs> called emotion. Now I take that little word, I put this giant iron bar on it, and I throw that truck right, I can throw it right through your heart. That is what you want to do when you get up to speak. You want to take these little crappy little things called words that so many people just utilize like stick pins, and you want to attach a level of intensity and power and depth and emotion to it that you can go right through whatever used to stop somebody in terms of their armor where you can reach people that other people don't reach. 
You practice those ten things, and you get yourself to the point of doing it ongoing, you have one of the greatest gifts in the world because you know you can go anywhere in the world with just your thoughts and your lips, and you can change the environment. You can change people, and you can change your own world. That's what being a trainer is all about. I wish you best. Have some fun tonight, and I'll see you guys soon.